Hello, Soundies. Welcome to our Sound for Video session. Great to have you here today. Hope everyone's doing well out there. And I think, is today the first day of spring? Or it is? It is the first day of spring. So for those in the Northern Hemisphere, um, happy spring to those that are uh, <laughs> celebrating things like that. It's good to, uh, again, to have you all here. Let's go ahead and take a look at our agenda and see what we have going for today. First up, our signal chain. I like to run through that each day. I think people have curiosities about that. And so today we're using the Earthworks Ethos for my microphone. Uh, that's running into the Rupert Neve Designs Shelford channel. That's its preamplifier. It uh, does have a high pass filter, a little, tiny bit of EQ, a compressor in case I get pretty excited. At some point here, we're talking about decibels, which may happen. Um, and then that is fed out. Uh, line level into the Canon C70, which is a camera we're using here. And then that feeds a signal into the Blackmagic ATEM Mini Extreme Microphone. And then that feeds a signal into the Blackmagic ATEM Mini Extreme And then that actually outputs via HDMI to the Epiphan Video Pearl Nano. And that's what's actually encoding everything and sending it over to YouTube. So that's what you're hearing and seeing today, just uh, out of curiosity. Um, Coming up, we mentioned this last week, just wanted to mention it again. We do have coming up a Dialogue Edit Mix Master Challenge. And this will be an opportunity for you to submit a approximately 30 second mix of Dialogue Audio that you can have uh, reviewed by a number of people in the industry that we will have joining us here as our um, judges. and. It, I don't want to say that the wrong way. <laughs> this is all to help all of us get better and taking this opportunity to practice our dialogue mixing. And so I think you'll be pretty excited once I let you know a little bit more about the details as that comes up. We're probably looking sometime in April or early May to do that. So be aware of that and start thinking about what kind of what clips you have, what mixes you have that you could potentially submit for that or start working on a mix that you could potentially submit for that. So we're hoping to have prizes maybe even. So um, <laughs> just wanted to let you know about that as we're getting closer. Uh, we will then, uh, next up, we're going to talk a little bit about decibels. I think there's a, decibels are an interesting thing because they're not uh, quite like other measurement systems that you may be used to. So for example, distance, we measure distance in kilometers or miles. And decibels works a little bit differently than that. It's a little bit more generalized than that. And so I want to talk about what decibels are because I think it can help you a lot in a variety of different situations when you're working with sound. And then we have a question that was submitted ahead of time, and we'll also go to the chat uh, as time permits to address any questions that may come up there. All right. So we're going to first talk about decibels. And I'm already pretty excited about this. We ran through it really quickly beforehand. Danny was asking all sorts of questions while I was on one slide. A lot of those questions ended up being answered on later slides. So <laughs> if questions come to your mind, uh, hang in there. We will come. We will, we'll go to the chat and, and see if there are any questions or anything that um, you're curious about when it comes to decibels. So let me just start with this. A decibel is one tenth of a bell. Now. First of all, the bell comes from Alexander Graham Bell, who is the one who is attributed with inventing the telephone. Um, but that still doesn't really tell us a whole lot, does it? So a decibel is one-tenth of a bell. What's a bell, um, aside from Alexander Graham? Well, a decibel is a unit used to measure sound pressure or audio signal level by comparing it with a reference point on a logarithmic scale. That's the definition. And that is actually still not necessarily super clear, but we're gonna talk about it more, so I think it will become a little bit more clear. So the first question that I had is, why do we use a logarithmic scale when we're measuring things related to sound? And I think the answer comes in a couple of different ways. We'll give some other examples as we talk about this a little further. But first of all, it's important to understand, for example, that humans can hear sound pressure levels between 20 micropascals and 20 pascals. And don't worry so much about what a pascal is. It's a, it's a way of measuring movement of, you know, molecules in the air. But that is a massive, massive range. That is a ratio of 1 to 10 million. So that's a huge, huge, huge range. And 
Um, representing that, working with huge, huge numbers like that when you're trying to do something quickly, <laughs> as humans, that can be a difficult thing. And that's part of why we use a logarithmic scale. And let's actually go over to the Mac really quickly here. I have in on the Mac here, I have just a, a one kilohertz tone uh, in, an, in a clip here. And I have the fader over here. I want to focus on the fader here. We'll come back to this tone and play that a little bit later. But and it's probably a little bit difficult to see if you're on a small screen, but let me just describe it for you and I'll walk through, even if you're on a small screen, what's happening here. But if I wanted to drop the level by 10 dB, I would take the fader and drop it by 10 dB, okay? And then if I wanted to drop it 10 more, I move it down like this. And this time I moved a little bit less. I didn't have to travel as far with the fader to get another 10 dB. And now if I wanna to go to 30, that's about here. Again, travel a little bit less to 40, traveled even less to 50, even less to 60, even less <laughs> to 70, even less, and then to 80, and then to 90. You can see I'm moving less and less and less each time to drop by another 10 dB. That's a logarithmic scale. Now, you might ask yourself, well, okay, got it, that makes sense, but why? bring this home. How, how does this make any sense and why is this important? Well, here's the thing. If we had the same amount of travel between 0 and minus 10 dB all the way down the scale, first of all, we would never it would never happen because the lowest setting you can get to is minus infinity. That means it would go on literally, this fader would be, it would go on forever. There would be no end to this fader. <laughs> um, but if you took, even took it to a practical level and say it, say it bottomed out at minus 120 dB, and if you had the same resolution between 0 and minus 10 all the way down the fader, this fader would be, I mean, we could calculate it, but I'm going to guess it's going, it would probably be um, a meter or more long. And that's really not practical. Even if you had a physical mixing board, a, a meter long fader is not practical. <laughs> so that's part of the reason why we use logarithmic scale when we're working with sound or anything where we have a really, really wide range of potential values. It just makes it easier to work with. And what this, we'll come back to this and, and talk about this a little bit more, this concept a little bit more, and how it serves a very practical purpose. Okay, let's go back to our keynote here. All right, so here's the thing that's interesting is decibel is a ratio of one value to a reference value. So what that means in practical terms is that a decibel is not like a mile or a kilometer. It's not a set physically measurable distance in all cases. It actually differs depending on what it is you're measuring with the decibels. And that'll become a little bit clearer here in just a second. So we're gonna talk about four different flavors of decibels. That's only four, there are actually a whole lot more than that. If you go to Wikipedia and look up decibel, you'll see there are probably a definitions for, um, I think probably 40 or 50 different types of decibel measurements. And you, you often, um, You'll see them referenced in various ways. So here, for example, we see dB SPL, we have dBU, dBV, and dB full scale. So there are lots of different ways, different things you can measure related to sound with the decibel scale. And let me give you some a uh, little bit more detail here. So let's talk first about dB SPL. So that's sound pressure levels, and so we're talking about right here on the graph or the, the chart here. So dBSPL measures sound pressure levels. What's a sound pressure level? That is actually something you can measure in a room, in a space. You can measure how loud the audio is in that particular space. And so they're actually on the market available, SPL meters, dBSPL meters, little handheld meters. You can actually go into, for example, a venue where there's going to be a concert and you can measure the decibels SPL Say, for example, you're standing a meter from the loudspeaker, maybe three meters, just to be careful with your ears. <laughs> you can actually measure that with that meter right there. So you're actually measuring, essentially, the movement of the molecules of air. All right. So that's that's one thing. Um, the reference level, and, and every, every reading that you get on that meter is in reference to 0 dB SPL, which is 0 0.00002 pascals. So that's what dBSPL is. Everything that you read on a dBSPL meter is, in essence, how much louder than 0 0.0002 uh, pascals in dB is what you're measuring right now 
and that's what you're getting. And so that's always going to be a positive number on those meters. Now let's go down to DBU. So that's the next one here in the graph or the chart here. DBU is actually measuring voltage. And so the reference level here is 0 dB is equal to 0 0.775 volts. Now, where does this come into play at a practical level? A, a DBU meter is something you will often see on an analog mixing board. So if next time you're at a, a venue and, you're, and you get a chance to look at the mixing board or somewhere where you can look at a mixing board, you will notice that it has a meter. Usually it's a series of LEDs. And you will see that it's actually marked. It will generally start somewhere around minus 60 dBU ish somewhere in that realm it depends on the meter um, but then it will often actually go up to plus 20 dbu and that's possible in this case again because zero dbu is 0.775 volts so if the system if the mixing board has a, a nominal level that's above 0.775 volts it's actually going to show as a plus something on the dbu meter and that is perfectly you know that's a very different situation here so generally the, the signal level will be at minus something, but once it goes beyond zero dBU, once it surpasses that voltage, it will show a positive number as well. dBV, next one here in the chart, is also a measure of voltage. This is typically used more often in consumer electronic equipment, um, consumer electronic playback systems, you know, audio systems. Um, that's also measuring voltage, but it uses just a different reference point. It uses d 0 dBV equals 1 volt. Um, and so you're less likely to see that as much on professional audio equipment, but um, some, some of them are switchable. In fact, I think my Shelford channel here on the back, there is actually an output. If you wanted to, you could get a minus 10 dBV output, which is basically consumer line level, whereas typically professional line level is considered plus 4 dBU. So they're just measuring it different ways. Nothing nothing else magically different about it, except they're just measuring it different ways. Um, and then the consumer line level is, is basically at a different voltage than you'll typically find for um, professional line level. Okay, let's go to talk about the next one. This is the one that most of us are working with probably most often, unless we're doing live sound a lot, and that is dB full scale. That's what the FS stands for, full scale. And this is a measure of digital headroom. What does that mean? <laughs> that means it's measuring how far from zero dB the audio signal is at any given time. And in digital audio, digital or dB full scale, which is digital audio, in digital audio, the max amplitude that audio can have is zero dB full scale. And that is actually represented by, um, at, it actually is, when, when you're at zero dB full scale, that is the max value that whatever encoding system you're using can represent. And let me talk about that in very practical terms. If you're using 24-bit audio, uh, what that means is that if you're at zero dB, at that particular point in time, that sample is actually a value of 16,777,216. That's its value. It, that's, a, that's the number that will be stored in the file for that video, for that audio, excuse me, if you're using a 24-bit file. You can see um, it's a lot easier to say 0 dB than it is to say 16,777,216. <laughs> so, that's another example of why we use a dB logarithmic scale as opposed to actually reading out the values of individual measurements in time. So something um, worth noting there. If you're using 16 bits, that number is going to be a little bit different. It's going to be the max. Now, keep in mind that what we're talking about here, dB full scale, maxing at zero, that you might be asking yourself, well, Curtis, a couple of weeks ago, we, we talked about 32-bit float audio. How is that different? Because 32-bit float audio can actually go ab above 0 dB. And yes, that's a special case. Um, so <laughs> we'll put that aside for that previous conversation. But in the case of anything where you're encoding digital audio on a dB full scale, um, with the dB full scale, the max you can go to is 0 dB. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about what some of these things mean in very practical terms next. 
One thing, you have to be careful. You cannot use simple addition or subtraction for your calculations. So if you want something to be, well, let, let me give you an example here. If you were to go to a venue where we had a loudspeaker set up and we were putting some music for through it, or maybe even just a tone, and you took your dB SPL meter up to it, and you're standing, say, a meter away, and you took a measurement and it read 90 dB SPL. First of all, you should be wearing ear protection if it's that loud and you're that close to it. But secondly, um, if I took another speaker and put the exact same signal through it, the same power, and so now both of those speakers are right next to each other, they're both putting out that same amount. If I take a measurement with the dBSPL meter, what do you think it will say? And the, the question is, well, would it be 180 dBSPL? And the answer is no, it would not. <laughs> it would actually probably read right around 93 dB SPL. Kind of mind-bending, you think, at first. Um, but that's you have to be careful. Again, we're using logarithmic scales, and it, it depends on a lot of other factors. So, um, that, that is a doubling of what you hear, though, right? No. No. So Danny doesn't have a microphone, so I'm sorry for that. I should have set up a microphone so you could ask that question. But... No. Um, the question she had is, is, it's a doubling of what you hear? I don't Not know. exactly. No, it is louder. It is louder. Perceptually, it will be a little bit louder, um, but it is not a doubling in loudness. And I'll, I'll explain that in just a second. So hold on here. <laughs> um, so when we talk about doubling things, in fact, that's a perfect segue into what I want to cover next. And, and let's talk about doubling something on a dB scale. So if you're working with dBU, again, remember, that's measuring voltage. If you want to double that voltage, you need to increase it by 6 dB. Or if you want to cut it in half, that voltage in half, you need to reduce it by 6 dB. Okay? If you're talking about loudness, perceptual loudness, if you want to ha cut it in half, you want it to be half as loud, then you need to reduce it by 10 dB, roughly. Or if you want it to be twice as loud then you would increase it by 10 dB, again, roughly. I think I was talking about perceptual loudness. Yes, I think you're talking about perceptual loudness. Exactly. All right, so let's go back to the Mac, and let me just demonstrate that here. I want to play this tone for you. And while we're playing this tone, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to take the fader and adjust it down by 10 dB in steps. And it should roughly sound half as loud each time I do that. So let's see if that pans out. Here we go. There's minus 10, minus 20, minus 30, minus 40, minus 50, minus 60. Okay. To me, perceptually, that was pretty close. So if, you know, when I, each time I dropped it by 10 dB, it was roughly half the loudness of before. And we can actually go back the opposite way. Let's try that as an exercise. Start at minus 60. Minus 50. Minus 40. Minus 30. Minus 20, minus 10, zero. Okay, so there's an example there of that having or doubling when it comes to actual perceptual loudness. So let's take a pause there and let's see if we have any questions in the chat about decibels. I don't know that I can answer all questions about decibels, but I wanted to give that really basic kind of introduction so that you understand that decibels can mean different things depending on what you're measuring. Um, another critical point is that it's based on a logarithmic scale, so it's not a linear scale. And there's a practical reason for that so that we can actually represent the broad range of values that we need to represent. Okay, anything in the chat there? Mm -hmm. a few things. All right, let's pop them up. We, we might need to double check our math. Oh, okay. Daniel says it's actually a range of 1 million, not 10 million. Okay, I'll go back and double check that. Thank you for that. It's still exponential. Yeah, it's still exponential, but yes. 
Is it true that zero dB SPL is the sound pressure level at the threshold of human hearing? I think that's an approximation, Shoji. I think that's a good question. My sense is that's approximation, and it's going to depend on the person <laughs> as to whether or not they can actually detect a um, zero dB SPL signal or not, or or let's say a one dB SPL audio um, or sound pressure level. I tend I tend to use even high gain instead of plus four dB on my RME line out inputs when analog preamps are connected. As back in the days, this tape machines, uh, the tape machines could take more than plus four dB. Okay, very good. Was Shoji asking actually if zero is like the loudest you can hear? Like zero, like no, no, okay. Time to dig out my old slide rule. <laughs> you might have to. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's fun. There's a little bit of math involved, um, but I tried to keep it as simple as possible there. But yeah, slide rules are helpful. Uh, Shoji, if I if a signal changes from a one volt to ten volts, how many decibels is this, and how do you calculate? Uh, I don't know the answer to that right off the top of my head, but that is a massive, massive difference. And in fact, most um, electronic sound systems cannot, I don't believe, handle a change that large. Um, I could be wrong about that. I don't know all the, the ins and outs, but that's a huge, huge difference there. Um, Yes, I don't know the answer to that, Shoji. I think if you go to the, um, there are a couple of articles I linked down below um, when I was that I used to kind of prepare for this here. Uh, there's also a very good article by Kyle over at Audio University. If you search Audio University Decibel, just on Google or whatever search engine you use, you'll find that. He talks a little bit more about calculating. Um, so I would take a look at that. We, there are some others, but they will be at the end. Okay. All right. All right. Well, let's jump over to a question we had submitted ahead of time um, and take a look at that. So here is the question. I have been creating the soundtrack for a film in a digital audio workstation. The film is interview-based, and so the most important sound is the dialogue. I therefore started the mix by working on dialogue and then adjusted the levels of ambiance, spot effects, meaning sound effects, and music accordingly. I have some decent studio monitors, KRK Rocket 5s, which I calibrated to give 75 dB SPL at my monitoring position using white noise at minus 20 dB full scale. This is the recommended setting for a small mixing room. Okay, I'm going to pause there that he hasn't gotten to the question yet. <clears throat> this, first of all, um, is a way to set the, the volume, essentially the loudness, the, the dB SPL, of the audio in your mixing space. And the reason you want to do that calibration is not because it's the, the ultimate volume or the right volume level. It is a safe volume level to be mixing for multiple hours on end. <laughs> um, it's a 75 dB SPL. You should be safe to do to listen at that level for eight hours and not sustain any sort of permanent hearing damage or anything like that. And yet it's loud enough so that you can generally make everything out and be able to hear separation or hear the differences between various sounds within your mix. So it's largely about safety and convenience and um, you know good working conditions as opposed to anything beyond that. So I just wanted to kind of throw that out, first of all, as a, as a start. So I'm assuming that the way you did this is you, re you, you queued something up in your digital audio workstation at minus 20 dB, a tone, played it back, and then while you did that, you adjusted the volume level of your monitors while using a dB SPL meter of some sort. And then you adjusted the volume until it was at 75 dB SPL. Very good. This is the rest, rest of the question from Bartle. I then adjusted the dialogue for a loudness of minus 27 dB LUFS as recommended by Netflix. Let me, let me stop there. Um, I'm going to get a little particular here. It's not because I want to just be nitpicky, but there is an important thing here. DB and LF, LUFS are not the same thing. So normally when you say minus 27, it would be minus 27 dB full scale, minus 27 LUFS, or minus 27 dB, whatever it is. But you're kind of mixing up two things here. So I think really what you mean here is that you adjust the dialogue for a loudness of minus 27 LUFS, not dB. Uh, this sounded plenty loud enough, and indeed the whole mix sounded great when played in the digital audio workstation through the studio monitors. However, 
when I bounced it out and rendered it out from DaVinci Resolve as the film's soundtrack, it sounded very muted when playing through my computer speakers. Okay. Um, I don't know what Netflix's target loudness is for the full, full final mix. Um, usually when they have a target, it's for the full mix, not just for dialogue. Um, I haven't looked at their specs in particular, so I don't know, but I would expect that there would be an LUFS target for the entire mix. So you're going to want to measure the entire mix, first of all. Um, second of all, minus 27 LUFS, if that is the loudness that you're getting for your full mix, that is a little bit on the quiet side. And speakers like in a computer or in a computer monitor or in a laptop or a phone, um, if, if it's sitting down that low in terms of overall loudness, it, those systems are going to have a little bit of trouble playing it back. You're going to have to go to max volume, essentially, to get a, a reasonably loud enough um, you know, sound that you can hear everything. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. Continuing on with a question. I then saw a tutorial you had done where you recommended aiming for an overall loudness of minus 17 dB for videos. Again, not to be nitpicky, but that's minus 17 LUFS, not dB. I have adjusted my mix accordingly, and now it sounds great when played through the computer speakers, but far too loud through the studio monitors. What's going on? Why is the calibrated environment so different from reality? Well, there are two things going on here. They're related, but they're not exactly the same thing. Loudness in the digital encoded audio is different than volume. So <laughs> the reason that I typically recommend that for online videos, you target minus 16 or minus 17 LUFS is because a lot of times people are playing those back on their phones. And the phones have these you know, tiny little speakers that are only capable of pushing so much in terms of power and creating creating the sound, recreating the sound that you're trying to play back, um, they just don't have that much to push. They they so they need us. They need a digital encoded file that's already relatively loud. It's already sitting relatively high in amplitude for a sustained period of time. So that's essentially what LUFS is measuring: is that kind of perceptual loudness, the um, the sustained amplitude over time. So, um, Bartle, it's fine. It's perfectly fine to adjust your volume on both your, your you know, whatever playback system you're using, your computer speakers, your phone, whatever. Um, if, you, if you target minus 27 LUFS, I will say this, you're probably going to have to crank the phone or PC speakers pretty close to their max to get that to play back at a level you can hear comfortably. Um, the studio monitors, on the other hand, when you're pushing, you know, when you have a, a file that's, First of all, you calibrated it, so it's at 75 dB SPL for a minus 20 full scale, minus 20 dB full scale audio signal in your digital audio workstation. Then those those monitors are just capable of doing more. They're capable of moving the particles of air around you more effectively than a tiny little phone or a PC speaker can. So, don't confuse. Don't confuse volume with loudness. That, that's, I think, the thing that, that's kind of getting things tripped up here. So I would say also as at a practical level, minus 27 LUFS for the final mix for a film is probably too low. I would probably go at least to minus 24 or minus 23. And I double check the Netflix um, targets for loudness. And if you if you want to email me directly, I'd love to work with you on, you know, finding the, the right levels. But generally, I think you're going to need to have it louder than minus 27 LUFS. So hopefully that makes sense. Thanks for the question. I really appreciate that. It's a it's a really good question. I think something that we all kind of our mind, our minds get a little, I know my mind got a little bit uh, tripped up when first kind of working through some of those things. All right, let's take a look at the chat and see what's happening in the chat. Danny's going to comb through. First up, from John, how does Fletcher Munson play into loudness perception? Um, it very much plays into it. They use A weighting when they're doing the calculations, as I understand, at various levels. So if you, we did talk about loudness in, in fact, I did a video on my main channel, Curtis Judd on YouTube, where I talked about what loudness is. And I put a link there to the actual specification by, I, don't, I can't remember if it was, the, I, I think it was the ITU specification, where they actually talk about calculating LUFS. And they use A weighting as part of it. So that, that represents, for those that aren't aware, the Fletcher-Munson curves essentially 
illustrate how human hearing is not sensitive to all frequencies at the same level. There's some that we're more sensitive to and others that we're less sensitive to. And so the A weighting takes that into account. It takes into account the reality that we can't, you know, we don't perceive something at 15 kilohertz at, say, um, yeah, we just don't, we don't recognize something at 15 kilohertz at one, at one given level and something at two kilohertz at the same level, the same way. This, the, the higher pitch one might sound actually louder to, to us or, or le- I don't know the exacts there, but it doesn't always sound the same to us. So there's some differences there and that's what A weighting does. So it's a great question, John. Thanks for that. Shoji, just curious, when you are working on a voiceover project and need to change the level, what's the smallest change in dB that you can hear or detect? That's going to differ from person to person. Um, One of the kind of rules that a lot of people throw around is the 3 dB rule, is that if you make a change by 3 dB, most people can detect that change. And in this case, let's assume we're talking about 3 dB full scale. Um, And again, it's important to specify which particular dB scale you're talking about there. But yeah, if you make a change by 3 dB full scale, most people can detect that. Some people claim that they can detect changes at 1 dB, and that may be true with a tone. I think it's less likely that people are able to do that when it's dialogue or music or something like that. But some people have really good hearing and they can actually hear those differences. So that's a good question, Shoji. Thanks for that. All right. When LUFS is measured, why is it measured over a period of time? It is measured over a period of time because that is important to perceptual hearing, the way humans hear. Um, We don't hear, if you were to play back, I did this experiment on one of our previous Sound for Video sessions. If you have a waveform that is at minus 6 dB full scale, Okay, so it just goes up once. It's just a blip, just a transient. It just goes up once and back right back down one time. And then you play a tone, a continuous tone at minus 6 dB full scale that um, sustains, say, for example, for five seconds. It turns out that the one that sustains for five seconds will sound much louder to us than the one that just happens for a single cycle for a, just a very small fraction of a second. So even though they're technically the same in terms of the dB full scale, scale, they actually are heard by us differently. And that's why it's important to measure loudness units, or that's why loudness units full scale is actually designed to work over a period of time. And in fact, um, there are various um, measures. And in fact, I think we can pull that up. Let me see if I have the Yulian loudness meter on here. I don't. Um, let's pull up a different meter. Come to effects, and I think it's under special. It's kind of here. I can't remember if it's the loudness meter. No, it's the loudness meter. Let's go with the radar meter from TC Electronic. Okay, so this is actually measuring over time, you can see. There's also a loudness range that'll basically give you the the um, the range of audio, like essentially the dynamic range. I mean, you can think of it in those terms. Um, this is measuring LKFS. That one doesn't illustrate it as well as I'd hoped. Let's go back to this one here. Yeah, here you can see the different measurements. So there's momentary, integrated, short term. So these are different lengths of time in essence. So integrated would be the entire program. That would be from the, the moment you started playing um, to the current time or when you stop playing back the audio. That's what the integrated loudness is measuring over that entire period of time. Short term is going to be a shorter period of time and momentary, I believe, is even shorter than that. So short term is probably like a period of five seconds. I, there's, a, there's, a, there's a technical definition. I'm just giving you, this is not the technical number. I don't remember how long the short term is, but it's some number of seconds and momentary is for even shorter than that. So you can see these different... Um, meters actually do measure some of those things as well. So the idea is that that's, I think I've answered that. Hopefully that makes sense, Shoji. Okay, next up from Mark. 
from Sound Reinforcement Handbook. Since our ear sensitivity is logarithmic, dB values relate to how we hear better than absolute numbers or simple ratios. Another great point. Thank you for that, Mark. And that's very cool that you have that book. I was actually, we were looking at that last night. <laughs> for those that are not um, familiar with that, that's Yamaha's Sound Reinforcement Handbook. It's a um, it's a classic. It's very technical, um, but super, super valuable. Darrend, does the inverse square law apply to audio like it does for light? It certainly does. Um, I don't know if it's exactly the same, but yes, the farther you get away. So for example, one thing you'll hear a lot about is the, um, what is it called? I'm trying to remember the name, but when you're setting up microphones, multiple microphones in a space, one of the challenges is that if I have me sitting here on this microphone and Danny's sitting right next to me here on her microphone, um, what happens is when I talk, my microphone, of course, picks that up, but her microphone will also pick me up. And one of the things that you generally want to do to help avoid those bleed issues, if you can, is that you generally want to have the distance between me and my mic and my mic and the other person's mic to be the, the distance from my mic to the other person's mic should be three times the distance of me to my mic. And that will help reduce some of that bleed. And if you can get farther than that, even better. Um, but that's that's kind of an illustration of how it works in a similar fashion to the inverse square law with light. Um, so yeah, there's definitely that that kind of element or that principle still still seems to apply. I don't know the the particulars in terms of you know is it exactly the same with the inverse square, um, but yeah, definitely there is a relationship there. Sheriff Logs, most modern mic, mu oh, sorry, most modern music like pop is at minus nine LUFS and EDM music like dubstep is minus six LUFS. The loudness war is definitely a problem in music. You know, it's interesting. You're right. Um, what's interesting, though, is now that the streaming services are trying to make a good experience for their listeners, they are actually changing that. And you'll actually notice this. YouTube does a similar thing. If something is louder than their target and the target that appears to be kind of standardizing is minus 14 LUFS, if the the and, you know the original music is louder than that, they'll actually just pull it down. So in fact, if you have some meters on an audio interface and you're playing that music back through your computer, you can watch those meters. And for that, a lot of that music that's mastered really, really loud, the meters will just top out at say like minus Eight or something like that, depending on, again, where they were mastered and, and what the target is of the, the streaming service through which you're listening to the music. But um, that's a really interesting thing. And it's, it's interesting to see that um, I think things are getting a little bit better <laughs> from the standpoint that now that the streaming services are um, managing the loudness playback, they are actually settling on loudness units full scale or LKFS, which is the same thing, just a different name in essence, um, at more reasonable targets. So so that, again, so that when somebody is listening to something, when it goes from one song to the next, they're not going to have to dive for their volume control to say, whoa, my gosh, this one's so much louder. I need to turn it down. Um, it'll be a much better listening experience. So yes, it is still very much alive in the music industry, but I think we're starting to see a little bit of a change um, now that the streaming services are imposing different loudness standards. Shoji, uh, great show, Curtis. DB is a confusing concept to properly understand. It is indeed. And I fell into a little bit of a rabbit hole getting ready for this, and I just barely scratched the surface. So there's a lot more to it. I appreciate that. Thank you. And then he had this question at the very beginning of the show. Oh. Going back to the beginning of the show, I need to apply basic compression to a voiceover, but the compression plugin raises the noise floor. Any suggestions? Um, yeah, I would probably use denoising. It, that will always be the case because if you're using compression to you know, bring the levels up, you're going to raise the noise floor. That is, that's normal. That's just what happens. That's the way that the compressor and the makeup gain works. Um, so I'd use a denoiser after that. And... Um, clean that up a little bit. That's probably, that's how I would generally approach it. And we, we demoed a really good denoiser last week, which would do a fantastic job on most, most voiceover, the Clarity VX plugin. Peter, 
For the dialogue mix, can you give details of what types are acceptable, i.e. voiceover, single voice, multiple? Do we read and record a sample and then process it? So it can be any of those. Anything, maybe it could be something that's part of a short film. It could be a voiceover, a, you know, a reading. Um, I would just use something that's not copyrighted so or, or that we're okay to play back on the show. We That is an important thing. So something that 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 you can grant us permission to actually play back on the show is important. Um, but it can be from anything. And, and it doesn't have to be multiple voices. It could just be one. If you want to put multiple voices in there, that's fine as well. Um, and it's the, the judging isn't so much based on how many voices you can cram in there. It's more about the quality of what you produce and how it, uh, you know, conveys its overall effect. That's the main thing we'd be looking for. And, you know, just a, a chance for you to practice and, and make the best sounding um, uh, dialogue mix that you can possibly make. So that's that's all we know so far. Um, Rob is working on it. Hopefully we'll have more details here in the next few weeks. Okay, from Martin or Martin. Uh, any news about the issue Waves Clarity VX has with Adobe Audition? You know, I haven't had a chance to follow up on that, so I don't have any updates on that. Um, just had a really busy week, so <laughs> I didn't get to that specifically. Um, but, I mean, you know, anyone can contact. You, you can actually download. I think they have a, a version that you can actually try. Let's check. Let me go to Waves. If I go to Waves.com. And I go to the Clarity VX. Is there a way to try it before you buy it? I think you can get a demo here. I Yeah, so you can actually try it. So I would actually try it and see if it's an issue on your system or if it was only my system. So that would be the first thing I would check. Um, and then if you run into any problems, you can, of course, contact their technical support. I, I just don't want you to wait for me because I don't know when I'm going to get to it. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for the question. Just a little comment. Here's a little comment from Tom. Uh, LUFS is comparable to energy, which is power over time. Very good. Yeah, and I would say uh, traditionally before we had the LUFS and the LKFS measures for perceptual loudness, a lot of times what engineers would use is they would use the root mean square or RMS dB level to estimate the loudness. And in fact, a lot of dB VU meters were actually measuring dB RMS. So it wasn't it wasn't exactly like a peak meter. Well, it wasn't like a peak peak meter. It wasn't a peak meter in a variety of different senses. But one of the things was is that the needle on those meters would move um, with ballistics such that it was it was representing more of the um, the root mean square, which is basically an average over time, just a very quick average over time. And that was a better estimator for overall loudness versus just looking at a peak meter. Um, again, because we don't hear in transients, we hear in sustained amplitude over time. So that's a great point, Tom. Thanks for sharing that. Mark says, a bit off topic, but generally, what dB level reduction would you recommend when ducking music under dialogue? Uh, well, see, that's a little tricky because I actually would recommend, ideally, I wouldn't just recommend ducking it. I would recommend, it, it, just in terms of just pulling the fader down on the whole thing. The, the music, I would actually preferably use a side-chained uh, dynamic equalizer. Um, so I would I would first of all try to carve out the part of the music, the, the part of the frequency range of the music that overlaps most with the voice. So that's going to be, you know, between maybe 500 hertz and um, maybe up to 2 or 3 kilohertz, somewhere in that range. Um, but I would try to scoop that out so that I can, you know, if out of the music so that that would leave room for the dialogue. That way you don't have to pull the music down as much. It can still sound very present, but it isn't competing as much with the dialogue. So it's a, that's a more complex or sophisticated way to approach it. But um, yeah, I don't know. I guess I would just do it by ear, Mark. I don't have a kind of a rule of thumb or anything. But if you're just going to pull the fader down on the music to duck it behind dialogue, Use your ear and make sure that the dialogue is still very much something that can be heard. And, and in fact, I would actually, even a very kind of brute force way of doing this, instead of 
it has its pros and cons but instead of using a fader to pull it down i i would i, I would actually just use a regular old eq and do that scoop thing that i just described um, i actually if, if you do a search for mixing music and dialogue Curtis Judd on YouTube, you'll you'll find a, an older video that I made where I showed just a very simple EQ curve that I applied to make uh, dialogue be able to stand out above the music and not have to pull the music down quite so much. So that's a little demonstration of that for you. Okay, uh, from Phil. It's a bizarre, confusing concept, dB. I was thinking earlier, is dB exactly related to gain or does it change per input type? Um, it depends. It changes per system that you're using and the type of meter that you're using to measure it. Um, <laughs> yeah, so if you're looking at an analog mixing board where you have a dBU meter, that's going to be different than in a digital audio workstation on your computer where the audio is already in a digital format and you're using dB full scale. So that's hopefully what we talked about today gives a little bit more clarity and makes it a little easier to, to make that translation. Incidentally, um, if you are one of the standards that is generally in use today, if you're trying to convert between dBU and dB full scale, is that in many cases, plus 20 dBU is going to be zero dB full scale, I believe. Um, so that's one thing we can look into that a little bit more. Um, but that's one one thing to keep in mind is that zero db on an analog board with a dbu meter is not the same as zero db full scale just that's the most important principle to understand in that particular case okay there's two different comments two comments um when will we get that neumann u87 ai review <laughs> has a u87 in his desk if you ask him nicely he might take it out and show you yeah we actually brought that out um last week uh, let's see here if you wanted to see it I don't know that I'm planning to do a review of it so much as use it as a reference in future microphone reviews so if I am doing a review of a large diaphragm condenser microphone in the future getting an audio sample from the u87 alongside whatever microphone I'm reviewing that's that's most likely what I plan to do with it that's what I that was what I told myself when the business bought this <laughs> microphone. So that's more likely what we're going to do. I don't know that. I mean, I, I don't. I don't plan to review it. It's more of a more of a reference. Just like in DB, you always have a reference depending on the type of DB that you're using. So this will be the reference for large diaphragm microphone uh, reviews. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, clarification. Uh, Vincent Rosenberg plus 24 dBU equals 0 dB full scale. Thanks for that, Vincent. Okay, I don't understand this one. I think it also... De oh, okay. Alan says, how loud is an unladen swallow in decibels? Uh, <laughs> you're trying to trip me up? You're trying to trick me, Alan? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> well, for reference, <laughs> this was an earlier comment. Oh, sorry. Wait a minute. Oh, Alan. Wait, wait. Oh, how many decibels is it when my wife yells at me? In dBSPL, I'm going to guess 92, depending on how bad you did something. I for you. Uh, sound speeds. <laughs> ha ha. Not sure, but we want to go there. No, I said that. Not sure we want to go there. Got it. Okay. Danny Sykes. Okay. Be careful, Alan. Um, if you really infuriate her and she's yelling at you at 92 dB SPL from where you're sitting, that could be dangerous for your ears and hers. So let's try not to do that. I don't think I can talk that loud. If you're close enough, you can. Well, then everybody can. Well, and this is, we're talking yelling here as well, so. <laughs> you know what I mean. Let's see. All right, what else have we got here? Oh, we have like a little scale here. Oh, we have a scale. 0 dB full scale equals high gain plus 19 dBU, 15 dBU plus 4 dBU, 13 dBU, 9 dB, 10 dB V plus T, 2 dBV. 
Okay, so there's a that that's a way to convert all of those. Interesting. Oh, well, and again, I think it's I think it's it, when you start talking about DBU, I think it's going to depend partly on the equipment. It's not always the exact same thing. So someone had said earlier plus 24 DBU equals 0 dB full scale. Um, you can see Tom has a different value. I, I think it depends partly on the analog mixing board. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. And maybe also, you know, how you're converting that audio and bringing it over to dB full scale and the capabilities of that equipment. I'm not sure. So roughly plus 20 dBU, roughly. <laughs> that, the sound speed cryptic question Tony notes may have been a Monty Python. Oh, it may have been a Monty Python reference. Yes. Okay, Thank very you good. Exactly, Thank you for that. Yes. Thank you, Alan. Hope everything's going well on your move. Uh, hi, my question is, what is the LUFS level ideal for sound for DCP video format to show in theaters? You know, there's. I don't know that there's a standard. And some of the, um, like, if you're if you're going to be entering your film into a film festival, oftentimes they will have targets that they want you to hit as far as loudness for your audio. My sense is that it's generally going to be the same as for television for broadcast, which is going to be uh, minus twenty four LUFS, or actually, in the United States, minus twenty four LKFS again, which is just a different name for basically the same thing. In the European Union, that's specified at minus 23 LUFS. So my sense is that for DCP in a theater, you're probably going to be want to be right around there, minus 23 or minus 24. That, the nice thing about that, um, going back to the conversation from earlier, the question from um, Bart is that if you, if you put it at minus 23 or minus 24, you don't have to compress it quite as much. You can retain more dynamic range, which I think is, to me very important for narrative storytelling in particular, or even documentary storytelling, having that wider dynamic range gives you a bigger palette to work with from a sonics perspective. Um, so I actually prefer, it would be great if even on online videos, at some point, once the, you know, the, the playback audio systems get good enough, in theory, we wouldn't have to push the loudness quite as high. Um, if we could if we could normalize or master everything to minus 23 or minus 24 LUFS to me that would be ideally ideal from a um, storytelling and yeah just from a storytelling point of view just gives you more dynamic range to work with oh, it's a good question Marco Kevin great to see you again Kevin hope you're doing well what do you trust more the meters or your ears uh, <laughs> Well, here's the thing. If you have, this is where volume becomes a, uh, an important thing and what you're using to play back the sound. So it depends on the context of where you're asking that question, Kevin. It's a really, really good question. Um, you can actually get up to zero dB full scale and not necessarily hear a whole lot of distortion if it only happens periodically. Um, you should avoid it, of course, but um, we were actually working on a live stream at work this last week, and um, one of our guests was running a little hot, and so we had pulled them down. But before we pulled them down, they pulled their levels down, I should say, um, they did clip a couple of times. Although audibly, it happened so quickly, and it was for just a, a limited number of samples that it wasn't super, super obvious, but we were able to get on top of that. So we were able to use the meters to detect that it was getting close and it was starting to happen. Um, and able to pull their levels down just a little bit. So, um, but I think there's a good point here as well that you do need to trust your ears to help you understand where things are at as well. And and what's interesting is that as you practice more and more, say for example, if you're doing mixes of voiceover or for films and you're having to apply, you're applying some compression, as you're listening back to other people's work, you'll start to be able to hear, oh, wow, that was really compressed. Um, your your ears will start to become attuned to that. So I think it is important to definitely use your, your ears and your meters, um, especially if you're going to be publishing, you know, to YouTube, you should care about that because the experience will be better if you do take into account your loudness units, full scale meters, um, and making sure that you're not clipping digitally. 
but I think you also need to take into account, well, how does this sound after I do that compression to reach that loudness target? How does it sound? And I've noticed on YouTube, for example, that there are a lot of people, a lot of popular YouTube channels that are now um, mastering their audio to minus 14 LUFS, and it's almost all spoken word audio. And to me, it's like, mm, some voices that can work okay with, but other voices, it just sounds through the roof. It just sounds too compressed. And even mine, it, it, my, my voice at minus 17, sometimes I'm like, oof, it's a little much. Um, so I don't usually push it all the way up to minus 14 because I just don't think it sounds that great. Um, and I think usually if you can get somewhere around minus 17, minus 16, that that actually is going to be loud enough for those people listening back on their phone speakers, but also not so loud that it sounds super compressed. So those are my thoughts. Kevin, that's a great, it's a great question. Um, but I would say both. I know you, <laughs> what do I trust more? I trust both more. <laughs> would you recommend mastering music LUFS in audio edition, uh, Adobe audition, excuse me. Um, yeah, I mean, that can be fine. I, most, most, uh, music mixing does not take place in Adobe audition. Adobe audition is very much, it seems like the majority of people using it are really working in the video world. Um, but you could, uh, you certainly could, and it definitely has the tools to do it. So yeah, you could do that, Phil. For sure. Jeffrey. I hope you answer me. This is from Moon Moon. Is there an alternative method instead? The time code sync device, especially if you have Zoom F6 or other with the internal time code recorder. Okay, who's the second part? The Ninja recorder monitor can be the solution to sync sound and video. Thank you so much. Oops, sorry. Um, going back to Moon Moon's question. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you're asking about time code. So um what you can do i don't know that i recommend it but what you can do is you can feed the output the time code output of the zoom f6 into your camera and you can record that time code output into your camera that'll feed through to the atomos recorder and at the same time you're recording the audio on your zoom f6 then in post you would have to convert the audio in the video clip to time code. So you're gonna to have to have a tool to do that, software to do that. One tool that can do that works really well with Blackmagic cameras, but doesn't necessarily work well with all other cameras is DaVinci Resolve can convert that audio time code that was recorded with the video into metadata time code or file time code, whatever you wanna call it. And then you would be able to sync up to your audio from the Zoom F6. Um, I would probably just feed audio from the Zoom F6 into the camera and then sync it up that way. That's um, That works perfectly fine as well. So that way what you're doing is you're sending a feed of audio from the Zoom F6 into the camera. It, that camera is recording the sound from the Zoom F6, plus you're recording on the Zoom F6. And then in post, you can sync those two up and, and you'll have the high quality audio clips from the Zoom F6. So hopefully that makes sense, Moon Moon. Okay. This is also two. Another two part question. I think. Tony, what LUFS or LUFS should we export to for YouTube? Also, what DB Max should our video be overall upon such export? And then Adobe Premiere has an LUFS setting in the media encoder. Should we use that to set LUFS or ignore it and import to Audition and make changes there? Okay, good questions. Let's go back to the first one. So that's a two-part what LUFS should we export to for YouTube? I generally target minus 16 or minus 17 for, for pieces that are mostly spoken word. That's my personal preference. There is no requirement. What I can say, the only requirement is I would suggest not going louder than minus 14 LUFS because YouTube will pull it back down anyway. Um, so I would target probably minus 16 or minus 17. The advantage of using minus 16 or minus 17 versus, versus minus 14 is that you won't have to do as much compression and so it won't have that especially compressed sound. Okay, so that's the first one. Now, the second uh, second piece of the first part is what about the dB max? In that case, you wanna set the dB true peak max to about minus 1.5 to minus two dB true peak. And the reason for that is that once your video gets encoded with the audio, it actually eats up a little bit of that headroom. So that's why you need to leave that minus 1.5 to minus 2 dB true peak. 
there. So your max should be about minus two. Let's just say that. Um, okay, second half of the question. Adobe Premiere has a LUF setting in the media encoder. Should we use that to set LUFs or ignore it and import to Adobe Audition and make the changes there? Um, you can certainly use the Adobe Media Encoder setting. So there's a little export. I, I don't remember. There's another tab you go to, and you can actually set the the loudness target there, and it will it'll boost your audio to hit that target. The only problem with that is that it will apply. I believe what that does is it applies a limiter. So if you get, it'll boost your audio up to the target that you set. Say for example minus 17, but then if anything goes above minus 2 or minus 1.5, whatever you set as the true peak ceiling, the dB true peak ceiling, it'll limit it. So the only risk is that if you if if it has to boost the overall levels quite a lot to hit your target, it'll sound heavily limited. So that's the only reason to not potentially use that. Like if you're doing something really special that you really want the highest quality audio, I'd probably go to Audition and do you know a proper mix there. If you just need a quick and dirty and you just need to make sure it's not clipping, then I think using the media encoder um, loudness units full scale export setting should be just fine. Hopefully that makes sense there, Tony. Good question. We're at 101. We're at 101, Danny tells me, and that means that we need to probably wrap things up here. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us here. You can see I'm a little distracted here because we have a lot of things going on and I have to kind of prep for the outro here to make sure that the music plays appropriately. I'm making checking. So I'm looking down here because down here I have, let me just show you. I have the computer with the mixer for the ATEM. So I have to make sure that the levels of the music, see the music was mastered way louder than I'm talking right now. So you'll notice, notice that one fader that's a little bit lower than the others. That's the music from the computer. And I also have to get ready to fade my own mic out and then mute it. And so that's why I'm always a little bit distracted here. <laughs> At some point, maybe when Emma comes to work for Light and Sound Media, she can do this. That'd be pretty cool, huh? Okay. Get out there, make some great sound this week, everybody, and we will talk to you again next week. Take care.